I arrived home by way of Jefferson Barracks in Missouri. A little more than four years for the career began when I was born on a family farm one and one half miles south of Reno. My parents believed in keeping us busy. So when we reached our early teens, they uh, fenced in an area of more than an acre west of our house where there was once an orchard. And to keep the children, to keep, to keep the chickens out, they put a fence around it. And that was our truck patch. We planted potatoes, sweet potatoes, lima beans, pole beans, sweet corn, watermelons, and cantaloupes. We had visions of producing enough vegetables to sell them in Greenville and become wealthy. All of the cultivation was done with a hoe. I should explain for the younger generation what a hoe is. It's an implement with a thin, flat blade on a long handle used for cultivating, weeding, or loosening the earth around plants. Me and that hoe became very well acquainted. Unfortunately, in the early 1930s, we had several very dry years, and our truck patch was not very productive. I was very glad when I was considered old enough to cultivate corn with a one-row, two-horse cultivator. On most days, I could cultivate eight acres per day, and ten acres was a big day's work. Long about this time, I joined the 4-H club, generally referred to as the Calf Club. As we had only five or six members, and with uh, each one had a dairy calf project. My dad took Ed and I to a dairy farm south of Greenville, and Ed paid $35 for his calf, and mine cost $37.50, as it was considered to be a better calf. They were both registered Holstein calves. I was disappointed at the county show that year because Ed's calf beat mine. Next year, when I showed her as a yearling heifer, she was named Grand Champion of the Dairy Show. A few years later, when I was a senior in high school, I showed an Angus steer that was named Grand Champion of the Beef Show. In those years, the County 4-H show was held at the city park, now called Patriots Park. 4-H club work taught me how to enjoy winning, how to tolerate, uh, how to be tolerant when not winning, how to keep records, how to conduct meetings, as well as how to complete the projects while I, which I carried during my 4-H career. I was fortunate to be selected as an outstanding 4-H club member, and I received an all-expense-paid trip to the National 4-H Club Congress held in Chicago for one week, and we stayed at the Stevens Hotel, then considered to be the best hotel in Chicago. We visited the International Livestock Exposition out at the stockyards and enjoyed the best in entertainment, including the Fibber, McGee, and Molly show, and enjoyed a luncheon at the exclusive Saddle and Sirloin Club at Stockyards Inn. One of my interesting 4-H projects was a quail raising project in cooperation with Western Cartridge Company. They furnished the materials and plans, and I built a quail brooder and a pen hatched the eggs, and raised quail. I became a 4-H club leader and continued this for many years after returning from the Army. We also had the rural youth group, which primarily was for recreation for those who were too old to belong to 4-H. For many years, we held monthly dances at the fairgrounds, and I learned to call square dances. Service in the Army took me away from the farm in 1942 and when I returned in February 1946, I knew that I wanted to farm and was engaged to be married in May, but I had no farm. I found a farm for sale that was considered to be one of the poorest in the area. The drainage was poor. The land had been tenant farmed for many years. The fertility was poor. There was severe erosion in some areas, and the only buildings were a house, a small barn, a small granary, and a small silo. The price was $65 per acre for 240 acres, a total of $15,600. Four people I asked for advice told me not to buy it. One person, the Federal Land Bank representative, advised me to buy it, and he loaned me the money I needed, so I bought it. 
During the war, I had been investing some money in farmland in partnership with my two brothers. So I sold my interest to Ed, and that amounted to about half of the purchase price, and I borrowed the rest at, I think, 3%. We were very anxious to get out of debt and had it paid off in three years. In later years, we purchased some adjoining land and enlarged the farm to 360 acres. Now we had a farm, but no machinery to farm it with, and no money to buy any. And right after the war, none was available anyway. My dad and my uncle Willis Williford loaned me the machinery to plant my first crop, and I was never able to repay them. So when my son Craig took over the farm, when I retired on Social Security, when I was 65 years old, I told him I was going to repay them by helping him get started farming. I worked for him without pay for one year. That spring of 1946 was a busy time, and we worked long hours. I finished planting soybeans in June, and I worked all day and all night to finish the job. I came to the house for breakfast, and I told Della that I would never do that again, and I never did. With the help of Ralph Kenfield in the Bond County Salt Conservation District, we improved the drainage, uh, seeded grass waterways to stop erosion, improved pastures, built erosion control uh, structures, and a new pond. And after about 20 or 30 years, that farm was generally considered to be one of the better farms in the community. Our first big project was to build a 60 by 80 foot cattle barn, about 1948. There is 33,000 board feet of oak framing lumber in that barn. My dad, Uncle Willis, Brother Ed, and Gene Dallenberg cut the trees in the timber west of the old Blackjack schoolhouse with cross-cut saws, hauled the logs to the sawmill at Donaldson, and then the lumber back to the farm, and uh, gravel for the uh, concrete was hauled from the creek in Merrill Alexander's pasture, and that's the uh, Yankee Creek. The concrete was mixed in a mixer mounted on an old Model T Ford running gear. There wasn't any uh, pre-mixed uh, concrete in those days, so uh, we shoveled the gravel from a pile onto the truck, backed the truck up to the concrete mixer, shoveled the gravel into the mixer, put in some water and some cement, and mixed a batch of concrete and poured it in the forms. We started the foundation in August, and Jess and Clem Williams were the carpenters. They began work about September 1st, and with some help from the family, when we were not harvesting crops, the roof was on and I had cattle in the barn by in January. I don't know how we did it. Many improvements were added over the years, including a hay barn, rebuilding the south barn, an expanded feedlot, a new silo, a machine shed, two large grain bins, remodeling the old house in 1957 and building the new house in 1972. Prairie Farmer must have been impressed with our practical and efficient farming operation because in 1969 they designated me a master farmer. The name Qview Farm was selected because the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, now the Burlington Northern, runs through the farm. Many people in the area referred to it as the Q. We thought everybody would know what the Q stood for, but we found out they didn't. So that goes back a little ways when people called it the Q. The year 1954 was one I will never forget. The summer months were so dry that the two wells we had made just enough water for us to use in the house and water 16 head of cattle. That was the year we built the pond dug a new well south of the old house, and, I never, and it never was a very strong well, and dug the north well five feet deeper. It was so dry that most of the corn reached only shoulder height and had no airs on it. I had one 30-acre field where I had plowed down heavy wheat straw, and it seemed to hold enough moisture that the field made 30 bushels per acre. The other corn we put in the silo, and it was so short that we had trouble putting in feeding it into the uh, insulage harvester, and it didn't have any ears on it at all. 
The house was on, that was on the farm when we moved there was uh, three rooms downstairs and three upstairs with a very small open back porch and an open front porch. It didn't have any running water or indoor toilet. We were told that uh, uh, it was uh, a Sears Roebuck house built about 1918. We don't know for sure that that was true, and I've never found any uh, notation on any of the lumber that would verify that, but that's what we were told. We installed a kitchen sink and a bathtub before we moved in. A pressure water system the next year dug all the trenches by hand. And one interesting thing about digging those trenches, I started digging those trenches and I was using information in the University of Illinois that they said to, to go 26 inches deep, and that's below frost level. And the old plumber that was going to put in the system for me came out there the first day and he said, how deep are you going with those, those water lines? I said, well, I'm going 26 inches. That's what the university says. He said, you go three feet. He said, I've known it to freeze 33 inches down. So I dug them deeper, and I went 33 feet deep. And as far as I know, they never froze. So I think his advice was pretty good. Then we built a utility room on the west side and closed in the front porch. The house had no insulation, no boxing. The weatherboarding was nailed to the study. We had insulation blown in and installed a furnace about 1950, and then were uh, more comfortable in winter. We'd been heating with a heating stove, fired with wood. In 1957, we added the downstairs bedroom and expanded the living room, and then built the attached two-car garage. Jane was two, year old, two years old and still taking afternoon naps when we remodeled in 1957. One day, as she was taking her nap in the northwest bedroom upstairs, the carpenter, John Daniken, took out the west window and the window frame and installed a new window and frame while she was asleep. He didn't see how she could sleep through all that commotion, but she did. Della liked to plan houses, and interior decorating was always, and, and she always wanted to build a new house. So in 1972, we did and moved in on New Year's Day, 1973. The walnut wainscoting in the dining room came from a house that was built sometime in the 1800s. Grandfather and grandmother Bomberger lived in it and remodeled it about 1914 and uh, didn't use wainscoting. So the old wainscoting was stored in the cattle barn in the, up in the loft until I got uh, some to put in the house. So some of that wainscoting came from a house that was built way back there. The oak post in the family room is from the old horse barn, still standing on the Kurt Bomberger farm. And that's a hand-hewn post about uh, 12 inches in square. And uh, I told the carpenter, I said, I want to put a wood post in there. And he said, well, he was going to put a metal post in. He said, well, if it's good and solid, he said, I want to see it first. And so I went down and got it and brought it up there. And he looked, took one look at it and he said, that'll do. So it's a good, solid oak uh, post that has some history to it. That post is hand-hewn, and the barn was built about 1840. The handrails along the stairs in the family room came from the old Sreno School that was built about 1890. The old porch post by the fireplace came from the old Mary House that once stood out on Route 127, about a quarter mile south of the second curve, uh, south of the railroad tracks. The walnut mantle was given to me by my dad and was from a tree cut on his farm. He always kept a supply of walnut lumber and he told us uh, children that if we wanted to build anything to come and get some walnut to do it with and so that's where that mantelpiece came from. There's one thing that uh, I uh, want to mention about my farming career out there and uh, when I bought that farm and I needed some drainage uh, done on the farm, I went to see Ralph Canfield. He was a soil conservationist in the county. And at that time, uh, Bond County had a partial district that didn't include the whole county. And he said, I can't do that because you're not in the district. That farm's not in the district. But he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, we're going to have a campaign to get the district made countywide. He said, if you'll help us with that, I'll come out there and uh, do that on my own time and make that survey, and he did. He came out there and did it on his own time. So I helped uh, get the uh, uh, 
Saw Conservation District made the countywide. Then we had some hearings and it was voted in and uh, from now, from then on it's been countywide and I served on the Saw Conservation County Board for 10 years. One of the things that uh, I like to repeat that uh, happened at one of these hearings, there was a man lived out here west of town uh, by the name of Warren File, but he was very progressive and he was very much in favor of the Soil Conservation District, but he had a neighbor that was very much opposed to it. And they were good friends. They both came to this hearing, and the neighbor that was opposed to the to the Soil Conservation District, he got up and made his speech, and one of the things he said was, he said, I'm, I'm against building all these ponds. He said, I just read the other day where somebody drowned in a pond, a farm pond. And he hadn't any more than sat down, but Warren File was on his feet, and he made his speech. And he said, well, I'll tell you what we need to do we need to get rid of all the bathtubs then, because he said, I read the other day where somebody drowned in a bathtub. So that was just a kind of an interesting sidelight. So uh, the uh, the farm is still there, and it, it now belongs to the, the children. When my first wife died, the children got half of the farm, and uh, Craig now has bought uh, most of the rest of it, and he lives in the old house, and uh, my daughter Jane and her husband live in the new house. So everything is still there, and it's still a farm.